On a hot summer's day, there's no place I'd rather be than the beach, as the water is not only refreshing to swim in, but also seems to clear the mind, offering some psychological benefits to be around, which is why I suspect that it has always attracted so many people for thousands of years to live along the shores of beaches, rivers, and lakes. In fact, almost half of the world's population lives within 60 miles of a coast, which got me thinking about one of the most interesting theories in the field of anthropology called the aquatic ape, which proposes that the ancestors of modern humans developed in a water habitat. There have been several authors who have made contributions to this theory, such as the German pathologist Max Westenhofer, who discussed various human characteristics that could have derived from an aquatic past. For example, humans are relatively hairless, the lack of fur making the body much more aquadynamic. Another uniquely human trait when compared to primates is that people have a layer of subcutaneous fat, which no other primate has, but is common in sea mammals such as dolphins, whales, and seals. Of course, the most interesting feature is why do humans walk upright, which I will talk about in a little bit. Humans have webbed fingers, which he claimed hinted at a semi-aquatic lifestyle in our evolutionary history. The regression of the olfactory organ or shape of the nose, where while swimming, water rolls away from the nostrils, diminishing the chance of it entering the airways, as well as the ability to hold our breath for prolonged periods. Speaking of breathing, another thing that I love about coming to the beach is sitting in the cool breeze and taking in the fresh air. While most people assume that forests produce all of the Earth's oxygen, in actuality, trees are only partly responsible, as up to 70 to 80% of the air we breathe, depending on the season, comes from algae in the water. While some algae floats near the surface to use sunlight for photosynthesis, there's also a type of algae that survives down by underwater volcanic vents, totally independent of any sunlight, that performs chemosynthesis in total darkness, a process by which chemical energy from vents is turned into usable energy, and an entire food chain is supported independent of any sunlight. This fact becomes even more interesting considering that there are rivers, lakes, and even oceans of water below the surface that we rarely think about, as there are many large subterranean caves that theoretically could be life-sustaining, meaning one could probably breathe and live miles below the surface, assuming that there's water, algae, and a food chain which does not require sunlight. Deep inside the heart of Chattanooga's Lookout Mountain, you'll find one of America's tallest and most incredible natural features, Ruby Falls. A hike through the mountain's cave system takes you right to the base of the 145-foot waterfall, which is believed to be the result of 30 million years of erosion through the limestone rock. The water is totally pure and safe to drink. That said, in a subterranean environment, especially in caves, there are several known types of fungi, or lichen, that glow and produce light. Since caves are void of wind, which is what usually blows mushroom spores around and helps them to propagate, there's a higher rate of glowing fungi in caves, as the light attracts insects and animals, which touch them and thereby help to propagate their spores. The less windy the environment, the more common it is to have glowing species. So, as nice as it is on the surface, with the blue skies, fresh air, and waves, there must also be underground cave systems that have water, oxygen, 
possibly fish, crabs, and other marine animals, glowing mushrooms or lichen, which is a plant-based like organism that has a symbiotic relationship with fungus, which can glow and is edible. If a subterranean environment has breathable oxygen, a sustainable food chain, and enough light to see in, then an evolutionary habitat below the surface becomes more plausible and might explain why some lighter skin tones do not seem very well adapted to the harmful ultraviolet spectrum from the sun. In all my years of study, I've never come across a single religion or mythology that places humanity's origins as having come down from monkeys in the trees. Yet I can cite numerous examples from around the world of myths and legends that claim that people first emerged from underground, whether it be the Hopi Indians, who I covered in a recent video that said they came out from the Grand Canyon, or the stories from Asia that speak about vast inner earth cities called Agartha, or Shambhala, which I also covered in prior videos. Please check the description for links to watch them. In fact, many researchers from a broad spectrum of sciences do not subscribe to the evolutionary sequence proposed by Charles Darwin, which states that small mammals called prosimians took to the trees about 60 million years ago, evolving into monkeys, which then came down from the trees and evolved into great apes, which then began to walk upright about five to eight million years ago, evolving into hominins or people. The German pathologist Max Westenhofer doesn't believe that humans are primates at all. While it is true that humans share over 90% similar DNA with primates, please keep in mind that house cats share 90% of its DNA with humans. Mice and humans share, on average, about 85% of their DNA. And people share about 80% of their DNA with cows. In fact, we share 61% of our DNA with fruit flies and 60% of our DNA with a banana. So genetics can be misleading when one does not understand DNA because much of the shared DNA is silent and is not involved in the coding sequence. While it might still be true that humans and other primates share a common ancestor in the remote past, the identity and origins of this ancestor is what is increasingly coming into doubt, as is the entire out of Africa hypothesis, especially in light of recent genetic findings which cast doubt on the idea that Sub-Saharan Africans were any sort of mitochondrial Eve, meaning they did not leave Africa and mutate into Asians and then mutate into Caucasians to populate Europe 35,000 years ago as Cro-Magnon, the name for the first fully modern human specimen discovered that has a chin, a round skull, a forehead, and exhibits all the traits anthropologists attribute to the term modern human. We now know, thanks to DNA, that humanity is a hybrid species, made up of different hominin species to various degrees, and that is what makes up the various races today. The same way that whales and dolphins can hybridize to create offspring called a wolfin, or lions and tigers can create viable offspring called ligers, or buffalo and cattle can create fertile hybrid offspring called beefalo, or a leopard and a lion can create a hybrid offspring called a leopon, or a horse and a zebra can mate and produce a zorse or a zebroid, or a coyote and a wolf can breed together and create a koi wolf. 
There are also numerous of examples in primatology of monkeys with different number of chromosomes that can and do create hybrids. And I'd like to repeat that. There are monkeys with different number of chromosomes. So in a taxonomy context, they are not the same species, yet they can produce viable hybrid offspring together, such as the case in Tabasco, Mexico, where the hybrid population is not allowed back into either of the parent species populations of monkey and is restricted to a 12-mile hybrid zone because of a genetic simian discrimination that takes place between the monkeys. These are black and mantled howler monkeys for anyone that is interested in looking that up on your own for further research. There are many other examples I could give, including about 16% of all bird species which can and do create new hybrid offspring species together. So this concept should not surprise anyone to find out that humanity is not one race that left Africa and turned into other races but a result of distinctly different genetic ancestry from different upright walking species that do not share the same history, the same behavior, the same blood type compatibility, or the same intelligence, regardless of how you define that term. In the most recent genetic research published this week in the journal Science Advances, Present-day Sub-Saharan Africans trace up to 19% of their genetic ancestry to an extinct archaic hominin species such as Homo erectus that's not found in the DNA of present-day Asians or present-day Caucasians. The professor that led the study from UCLA estimated that the interbreeding occurred about 43,000 years ago. That said, Europe was first populated by Cro-Magnon, or the first modern humans, around 35 to 40,000 years ago. And Cro-Magnon's DNA has been shown to be nearly identical to certain modern European populations and does not contain genetic contributions from this archaic African species, which is likely Homo erectus or Homo habilis or some other archaic hominin. So while this specific archaic admixture is exclusive to sub-Saharan African populations, other races have admixtures from other hominins which give them their unique phenotype and features. For example, this National Geographic article says that, quote, Asians too mated with archaic humans, DNA hints. It goes on to discuss the genetic contributions of a species called Denisovan to genes found in people living in and near southern China. Most people are already aware of Neanderthal interbreeding with Cro-Magnon, contributing about 2-3% to to Europeans and Asians, and also a trace amount has been detected now in the DNA of Sub-Saharan Africans. Because even though Neanderthal did not live in Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan Africans are a hybrid of Caucasians, which are part Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal, and these archaic African erectus species. In other words, Sub-Saharan Africans did not leave Africa and enter Europe to become Europeans, but the opposite is true. And European type Cro-Magnon, after interbreeding with Neanderthals, entered Africa and a hybridization occurred resulting in modern-day Sub-Saharan African populations. There are many other holes in the out-of-Africa sequence of events, including the still missing links in the fossil record, which instead of supporting the theory, consists of a number of fakes and frauds that have been displayed in textbooks for decades, such as the Piltdown Man, that prominently stood in the British Museum for the entire first half of the 20th century, which turned out to be a bleached baboon's jaw glued onto a human skull and touted as a human ancestor. Or in another example, Nebraska Man, which was publicized during the time that religion was banned from the classrooms in America in favor of teaching the Darwinian model, 
which included photographs of this specimen walking around, either cooking or gathering food from the floor. And despite the beautiful artistic interpretations, this too turned out to be based on a pig's tooth, which does look very similar to a human tooth. But all the images were imagination and speculation, fake news. Not only does the real fossil record refute a smooth linear evolution, it consists of examples of hybridization with numerous skulls which have attributes of different species of ancestor, such as the 30,000-year-old bones of a child discovered in Iberia, which has the chin of Cro-Magnon, the only specimen to have a chin, as well as other features attributed to Neanderthal. This hybridization is now verified as fact according to DNA, with various different species contributing genetics to the various different races we see today. So if humanity evolved in a smooth linear fashion from the same African ancestors, our blood types would be compatible, but it isn't. Not only do we require a blood transfusion from someone that has the same blood type, but if an RH negative woman is carrying a baby that is RH positive, her body may have an allergic reaction and attack the baby, which if not treated by medical intervention, otherwise could result in death of the baby. This does not seem natural, especially since I was unable to find one single primate specimen that has RH negative blood. That said, let's have a listen to Elaine Morgan, author of several books on evolutionary anthropology, and I will periodically interrupt to add my own comments. Um, next year is the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. And it's well worth celebrating because it told us about natural selection, which is the key to understanding all living things from the slime moles to ourselves. There are two things which I find worrying about it. One is that although it's very good at explaining a lot of orchids and fish and birds, it's never been very successful at explaining ourselves. It doesn't tell us exactly why we became naked or bipedal or why we can speak and the apes can't or anything of that kind. She's about to talk about primates and this does not take away from Charles Darwin's contributions in terms of his work on the Galapagos Islands, where he observed the various different types of finches, which is a type of bird, and noticed that they have different beaks, which were useful and adapted to the different diets available on various islands. And so it's not all or nothing. He made a lot of important contributions, which most people acknowledge. It's specifically about mankind and primates that this presentation will be focusing on. For instance, we take one example of why are we naked. On this question, they've not only failed to give an explanation, but they are now failing to ask even the question. If you look at the last 20 books to be published on human evolution, including textbooks and encyclopedias, 500 pages long, and there is not a mention in these books of the fact that we have lost our body hair. Try to imagine that there was one naked species of bear or a naked wolf or a naked rabbit and try to imagine anybody writing a whole volume about the species and failing to mention the fact that they were naked. It's impossible. And I would think that if you've got being naked may not be the most important thing about us, but it's certainly an important thing. It's a valuable clue. And if you've got a narrative that can't account for that, it seems very likely that you're on the wrong track. Unlike all other primates, humans have no hair. Humans might have some hair, but no fur coats. And humans sweat. So there's clearly a difference, and this should have an anthropological explanation. When Darwin wrote The Descent of Man, he didn't give any clear idea about what kind of habitat they were living in. 
if you read that book, there is no indication there that he thought they were in any different kind of habitat than the chimps or the, uh, the last common ancestor. He seemed to think that they were walking on the floor of the forest rather than in the trees, but then gorillas do that. And the first indication, uh, for the first few couple of decades after Darwin, that is what people thought. They thought, all right, the first humans, they were living in the forest. And to illustrate that, you've only got to think of Kipling's Jungle Book. He was interested in Darwin and evolution, and he thought they lived in the forest, like Mowgli. And you've only got to look at Hollywood and Tarzan, because Kipling's cousin, Edgar Rice Burroughs, wrote the Tarzan books. And they were envisaging the first naked biped with his big brain swinging through the trees. And that went on until the 1920s, when Raymond Dart found a town skull in South Africa. And he said, I think this was the beginning of humanity. It's not quite like a baby chimp skull. It's got indications of humanity. And since it was found out on the savannah, he said, I think that that is why we are different. This solves everything. Um, the ancestors of the chimps and uh, gorillas stayed in the trees. The ancestors of humans went out onto the savannah, and that is why they're totally different. And from that point on, up until today, this is what has been taught in all our schools and universities, that they became different because they laid on a lived on a savannah. And of course, they found a few uh, fossils out on what is now the savannah, and where you keep looking is where you keep finding them, so that they were convinced that to unravel all the, all the mysteries, you have to find the bones, fossilized bones, and fossilized teeth. And that will be the best evidence, because it's hard evidence. You know something really lived there. The explanation is because they went out onto the savannah. And that was held to be true for more than half a century. Then something happened. I don't know whether you've heard about it. It was a dramatic thing to happen, but it happened very quietly. They suddenly found that these savannah sites where the human fossils had been found were not savannah at the time when the hominids were living there. There weren't trees there. They had a new technique for examining fossilized pollen. They could put it under a microscope and they could find out what kind of plants that pollen would have evolved into. And it was not savanna pollen, it was woodland pollen. Some of it was even pollen from lianas, those great things you only get in the thick jungle. <coughs> so what were they going to do about that? Then we've got, we are the sweatiest animal in the whole of creation. And Alastair Hardy found it hard to believe, understand why, if we were on the hot arid savanna, why we would be sweating so profusely we wouldn't have been able to afford to lose all that water. So the primary explanation for why humans walk upright is to be able to see predators better, presumably to be able to run away. The accepted reason for having no fur is chasing prey and sweating, running long distances until the animals get tired or exhausted from running. A problem arose in the 1990s when microfauna analysis showed that the habitat was not a savanna during the time that the hominins were said to have developed bipedalism. They also found fossilized pollen that was not a savanna vegetation. Fauna means animals, so microfauna means small animals and plant life did not resemble the savanna habitat that the theory proposed. The most highly praised and valued scientist in South Africa was Philip Tobias. He was the man who named Homo habilis. 
He was at the top of his profession. He'd been a paleontologist for years. When he heard about this, he came here to University College London. He was invited to come to deliver the Dario Ford Memorial Lecture. And he came and said, I have believed in the Savannah theory all my life, and I've come here to tell you that you were wrong. We were wrong all the way along. We've got to go back to square one. We've got to think about it all over again, because all that was wrong. Now, this time, there was no reporter there in the back row, and nobody said, headlines all over the Sunday papers. South African professor says man is the ape. It was all kept very low key. He was enthusiastic about it. He said, you know, this is exciting. We have found something different. Now we've got to think it all out again. And this is a marvelous opportunity. But he was not treated as if it was a marvelous opportunity. He was treated as if it had been very tactless and bad manners of him to come and tell them that they'd all been wrong. Almost none of it got into the papers. Is it because he was wrong? No. If you read very carefully, there was a little bit in nature. The savannah hypothesis of human origins, in which the cooling system begat the savannah and the savannah begat humanity, is now discredited. There was one little bit in the Journal of Human Evolution. Recent evidence suggests that the common supposition that Australopithecines were grassland ducted is incorrect. So they didn't say he was wrong. They knew he was right. But they just, it was the same as they said about Darwin. They said, well, if it's true, let us at least hope that nobody finds out about it. And they seem to take the same attitude to, um, to Tobias. They carry on as if nothing had happened. They don't tell you, well, we're now at a loss, we've got no reason at all to explain why humans are different. They carry on as if nothing had happened. Why do they do that? This is what they always do. If you read a book, quite a famous book at the time, by a philosopher called Thomas Kuhn, he was talking about the structure of scientific revolutions. And he said this, that people get the idea that science is created by people assembling facts and confirming them and knowing that's safe to build on. And every scientist comes along, puts another little brick on that structure, and it grows higher and higher, and it's absolutely solid. And he said, but that is not how some of the great advances take place. From time to time, somebody comes along and says, I'm not going to put a brick on top of that pile, but I'm worried about this brick halfway down, and I want to take that brick out. That's, in effect, what Tobias was doing. The brick was the savannah there, and he wanted to take it out. And of course, that causes immediate consternation because nobody knows how much of the superstructure is going to collapse if you take out that one brick. So on the whole, they tend to go on, if somebody does that, ignore it and pretend it hasn't happened. And that is the position in which science of, of evolution is being carried on today. They know the Savannah theory was wrong, but they go on using the same language. And Thomas Kuhn says that is what they do. If, the, if, the, if a paradigm collapses, they've got to go on using it because you can't ask questions unless you've got some framework. So they carry on with it. And in fact, some people have got to the point of saying, quite frankly, Perhaps we need to stop worrying about selective pressures. We must stop asking that Darwinian question about what changed them, what the habitat was, because we can't answer it. So we'll just concentrate on something else. 
Now this was the opposite of what Darwin believed. He called this hypothesis free science. And he was he had complete contempt for it because in those days they, there were a lot of people doing hypothesis free geology. They were picking up pebbles and different rocks and stones and assembling them and said we'll, we'll classify them and we'll give them all names and numbers, but we won't ask why they are there and why there is chalk on, on top of a mountain. Um, and he said th there's no point in this kind of science at all, you've got to ask why. But at present moment, the powers that be have stopped asking why, and they're quite open about it. Now what Thomas Kuhn said was, they carry on with the old paradigm until a better one comes into sight, until they've got an alternative. The curious thing now is that there is an alternative there. There's a perfectly good alternative in aquatic theory, but they're not willing to look at it. What has happened is that very slowly evidence in favor of the aquatic theory has been accumulating, and very slowly all the reasons for believing in the Savannah theory have been withering away. But it's happened so slowly that they never felt, well, now is the time we've got to do something about it. A major proponent of the aquatic theory was a marine biologist named Sir Alistair Hardy, who specialized in the study of plankton, a basic component of the marine food chain and something Hardy was knighted for. He invented a device in 1925 to better record plankton levels and map out the distribution of different varieties. Hardy was also into spirituality. He believed that psychic abilities, such as telepathy, may have also played a role in influencing evolution and particularly early human development. This thinking outside of the box helped propel his ideas regarding the aquatic theory, which he proposed could explain many of the shortcomings that were becoming apparent in the standard ape hypothesis. Back in 1960, he gave a talk at a British scuba diving club and a month later published an article in the New Scientist called Was Man More Aquatic in the Past? There was only one man in England who didn't agree with us. That was Alistair Hardy. And in 1930, he conceived the idea that perhaps what explains our difference was not living on the savannah, but living in and near the water. He was brought to think that by reading um, in Frederick Wood Jones that he had cut open and analyzed a great many primates and a great many human cadavers. You could get them easily in those days. And he said, the thing that strikes me is whenever you cut open uh, a monkey or a chimpanzee or a gorilla, you come straight to the tissues. When you cut open a human, the first thing you come to is a naked skin and a lining of fat. Why have we got this lining of fat? And Alistair Hardy was a marine biologist. So he knew that this happens if you, if you start cutting open a seal or a dolphin or a great many um, aquatic mammals. What they have got is a naked skin with a lining of fat. And he began to look for other reasons why this might explain human beings. And it occurred to him that if you're a four-legged quadruped, an ape or a chimpanzee walking into the water, before you get in very far, you've got to stand up on two legs in order to keep your head above water so that you can breathe. Um, look at our babies. We've, uh, a newborn baby is five times, has got five times as much fat in its body as a newborn baboon. Why should this be? Well, one reason might be that it helps them to float. We have film of nice plump babies lying on the water, unsupported, rolling over and turning over again so that they're facing up. And that might have been one reason for it. It has this subcutaneous layer of fat. So that's a fair point. This theory has been miscategorized partly because 
it was given a lot of publicity in 1972 by a book I wrote called A Descent Woman. It was a bestseller in America. It was a book of the month club. It went into nine languages. And so people thought, oh, this idea about aquatic origins is being dreamed up by a Welsh housewife with no scientific qualifications, whatever. But if they tell you that, never forget, it wasn't me who started it. I would never have thought of it in a million years. It was Alistair Hardy, knighted, fellow of the Royal Society, and he had not spun it out of his head and told people he'd been sitting on it for 30 years and found nothing wrong with it. While many sources, such as Wikipedia, do in fact denounce the aquatic ape theory, I'd like to point out that it is taught at the university level, and if it had no merit, why is it still part of the curriculum? So, it is a valid theory, just like other aspects of the Darwinian model are still theory. Let's continue. So, what are the kinds of evidence that is advanced in its favor? Well, the approach by the aquatic theory, aquatic theory people is, let us make a list of all the ways in which we differ from apes. Nobody seemed to have done that. And let us find where else do you find these characteristics? Where else do you find naked animals? Nearly always in the water. Sometimes it's sea water, like um, at the dolphins and the manatees, and sometimes it's fresh water, like the hippopotamuses, but they're nearly always in the water. And we are coming to realize that the very few naked animals that are on the land, like the elephant, probably almost certainly had aquatic ancestors, so that in other animals where you get naked nakedness is through uh, rest, connection with water. Where else do you find anything right walking upright on two legs? Nowhere. No, neither on land or sea. But we do know that the only time when a, a, a chimpanzee or a monkey or a gorilla walks on two legs steadily is when they're wading through water. You may have seen David Attenborough in the world of mammals filming a, a gorilla going into a swamp to pick the plants there. And as soon as they go into water, all these primates do walk bipedally and consistently, for sometimes for quite long distances. As soon as they get on back land, they go back, back on their four legs again. Sir David Attenborough is an English broadcaster and natural historian best known for his work in conjunction with the BBC, including a documentary series that featured a segment on how primate bipedalism may have come about in a water habitat. I originally included the clip in this presentation, but was promptly given a copyright strike, so I'll just describe it instead. Mr. Attenborough got about waist deep into a river or lake and filmed some chimpanzees wading through the water. The upright position became possible for longer durations of time because the reduced weight in the water puts less strain on the chimp's hips and legs as it keeps its posture upright to be able to breathe. The clip was well done and only about three minutes long. If you'd like to watch it, I've included a link in the description. Where else do you find an animal with a fat lined skin? Always, they're aquatics. Where else do you find a mammal with a descended larynx? We are the only primate with a descended larynx. Until last year, we were thought to be the only land mammal at all with a descended larynx. Now they've found an American deer that's got it. But you can find them, not, not always, but quite commonly, among some aquatic mammals. Another thing that was brought up is the question of where we got our big brain from. And one thing was, how did we get the nutrition for it? 
Michael Crawford of London, he said that the thing about building a brain is that you've got to get a 50-50 balance of long-chain and short-chain fatty acids, omega-6 and omega-3. And he said the one place where your food chain supplies exactly that kind of balance is in the seafood chain. And he thinks that it was eating food from the sea which enabled us to um, have brain expansion at such a rate later in our evolution when it became necessary. We cannot smell as well as the other apes. The olfactory bulb in our brains is only half the size. The olfactory brain in the whale has disappeared altogether and you do find that the more aquatic the, the animal becomes, the less good it is as olfaction, obviously because it's not breathing air all the time. We have got voluntary breath control. None of the primates has got voluntary breath control. All diving mammals have got it and all diving birds have got it. And this is precisely why an ape cannot talk and we can talk. It doesn't explain why we can talk, but we know it's an indispensable precondition. We could not have learned to talk without that breath control. You can't teach an ape, not only you can't teach it to talk, you can't teach it to say, ah, because it's got no voluntary control. It's, it's one of those things that it can do, but it can't do that will. It's like an erection. You know you can do it, but you can't order it to come, and the, an ape can't order itself to, vo uh, to vocalize. I think she makes a fair point there. In school, they argue that modern humans needed to sweat to hunt, but the lack of prognathism points to an agricultural diet, as does certain aspects of some blood types, which I will address in a future video. I also find it interesting how babies can be born into water, totally immersed in water, and instinctively know how to hold their breath. Let's continue. Somebody told me once that, um, well, it, it can't be true, because if we'd been aquatic, we would have been streamlined like a, like a dolphin. But I ask you to visualize a diver with his hands above his head, diving into the pool and hardly making a ripple. And then I ask you to try to imagine a gorilla trying to perform the same maneuver and see much of a slush his mix. And the only way to define the difference between these two figures is that humans are beautifully, extraordinarily well streamlined to enter the water in that way. Humans definitely are more streamlined for diving or swimming in general than any primate. I agree. I'm trying to suggest that for 40 odd years, this aquatic idea has been miscategorized as lunatic fringe, and it is not lunatic fringe. And the ironic thing about it is that they are not staving off the aquatic theory to protect a theory of their own, which they're all agreed on and they love. There is nothing there. They're staving off the aquatic theory to protect a vacuum. Now then. <laughs> I ask people sometimes, and they say, well, of course, I like the aquatic theory. Everybody likes the aquatic theory. Of course, they don't believe it, but they like it. All I say. <laughs> Why do you think it's rubbish? They say, well, everybody I talk to says it's rubbish, and they can't all be wrong, can they? The answer to that loud and clear is yes, they can all be wrong. History is strewn with occasions when they've all got it wrong. <laughs> Yes, if they were wrong about Piltdown Man, and wrong about Nebraska Man, and wrong about Out of Africa in terms of race, then they can be wrong about primatology, as there's absolutely no primate fossil record. Every monkey or ape bones you've ever seen have come from a modern specimen, probably from a zoo, and the primate fossil record does not exist.
continue. Hardy's ideas and Darwin's ideas will be blended together and we can go forward from there and really get somewhere. That would be a beautiful thing. It would be very nice for me if it happened soon. Because I'm older now than George Burns when he was when he said, at my age, I don't even buy green bananas. <laughs> so if it's going to come and it's going to happen, what's holding it up? I can tell you that in three words. Academia says no. So I get the impression that some parts of the scientific established are sort of morphing into a kind of priesthood. But you know, that makes me feel good because Richard Dawkins has told us how to treat a priesthood. <laughs> he says, firstly, you've got to refuse to give it all the excessive awe and reverence that it's been trained to receive. Right, I'll go ahead with that. And secondly, he says, and you must never be afraid to rock the boat. I'll go along with that too. Thank you very much. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments so please leave me your thoughts below. Have a wonderful week, and I hope to see you again soon.